Hello and welcome to this Euronet Plus Summit organized by the leading radio network for EU News. We are thrilled to have today with us the Executive and Vice President Margrethe Vestager, who is in charge of all digital matters at the European Commission and is also the Commissioner for Competition. My name is Beatriz Rios and I will be your host, but today I will be joined by members of the Euronet network connecting live from all over the European Union. Hello and welcome today. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Let's start with the latest news. This week you had a new meeting from the Trade and Technology Council with your US uh, counterparts, but the outcome is merely to continue that conversation. We haven't seen yet any concrete outcome out of that negotiation. Are really Europe and the US on the same page on this matter? Well, I would actually contest that uh, because I think we have a number of deliverables. Uh, we have created sort of an, an early warning mechanism about standards being set so that we know oh, something is going on over here. We have a common interest. Go, go, go uh, to make this happen. Uh, we have a pilot uh, for the next two months to test how to set up a system to warn if there is a semiconductor shortage uh, on the way uh, so that we can work on that. We have the uh, work that has been done on uh, on export controls, so also setting up a fast uh, system here, and we have agreed on principles to prevent a, a subsidy raise for for the support for semiconductor production. But I think maybe most importantly, uh, the the Trade and Technology Council was part of what enabled us to be really fast and go really deep in the sanctions against Russia. Uh, as, a, as a reaction to, to their aggressive, uh, illegal invasion of, uh, of Ukraine. And, and these are, I think, concrete deliverables. So we have set the agenda, we have set the policy, we have started to deliver, and now, of course, we, we dig in for, for the next meeting that will be end November or beginning of December. What can we expect from that meeting then? Continue that cooperation. Where are we going? Well, hopefully we would have seen uh, us working together with third countries on uh, ICT investments uh, and discussions on governance, uh, because governance and ICTs ought to be two sides of the same coin. Uh, second, uh, to see what we can achieve on uh, fighting, uh, in particular, foreign uh, misinformation. So, you know, part of, for instance, what Russia is pushing in, uh, in for instance, some North uh, African countries, we ought to have results uh, on what we have agreed uh, in this meeting to do. We will definitely uh, following very closely. I'm going to be joined now by uh, my colleague Preet uh, from Cuckoo Radio, who has a question for you. Hello from uh, sunny but windy Tallinn, Estonia. Um, now, um, at least in Estonia, it seems uh, really, really strange to send documents signed on paper to Brussels. And it is even more strange to keep a stamp on the desk on uh, 2022, which we only use on papers that move either uh, to Moscow or, or Brussels. So how far is it when digital documents can be digitally signed across Europe? Very concrete question about this. Yes, a very concrete, but also I think very good question, uh, because it is in these sort of specific progress that you can see that this is a digital digital decade for Europe, and uh, I think we are quite close uh, because the the proposal for um, uh, EIDs to be uh, compatible all over Europe, uh, because we don't want to to slow down the Estonians, uh, because they are so advanced. Uh, on the contrary, we want the rest of Europe to catch up. So I think that we will be uh, quite close uh, for EID, for e-signatures, uh, because the convenience of that and also actually uh, the security uh, of that is, is on, the, on the high. Uh, a third example uh, where we have tabled a proposal is in e-health, mm -hmm. so that uh, patients uh, have their own data, health data, and so that you can also lock uh, who's looking into your health data. Because today, basically, if your health record is on paper, you don't really know who's looking at that if you're at a hospital or, or at a clinic. 
that will give more security as to who have actually uh, access. And that proposal has been tabled as well. So, you know, we're advancing, uh, but of course we realize that Estonia is, is setting a bar and it's a high bar and that's the way it should be to keep us all challenged. So it's a little bit both about protecting data, but also ensuring that within the single market, it's easier for companies to do business in different places, right? Yes, uh, we're still, you know, pushing for a real digital single market. So e-signature, uh, e-identity, really good progress for data to travel uh, even better. Uh, for the cloud service market to diversify so that uh, businesses, government, uh, different bodies can find the right kind of quality for uh, the storage of, uh, of their data in different kinds of, of cloud provisions. Um, all of this is work in progress, but I think, you know, concrete steps are taken. And paradoxically, uh, also here we learn a lot uh, from the war in Ukraine, because within, uh, I think, a week or, or 10 days, they managed to move their entire government administration into the cloud. Uh, so I think 16 out of 17 ministries, they are now fully functioning because they have their data in the cloud uh, and that is administered uh, outside of Ukraine to make sure that the data is safe. And I think it's a really good example of the security that comes from having your data in the cloud. And I think that is the kind of thing that we need to get used to, that it's not sort of the physical nearness of your data that is essential. It is being able to access it and knowing that the way it's stored is absolutely secure. Very impressive example. We're mm. going to stay on Digital Matters and I would like to welcome now my colleague Claudia from AMS in Germany. Thank you and hello to everybody. Um, Mrs. Vestaya just mentioned our digital space is a kind of work in progress and that the war showed us it's possible to do it immediately and very fast. And I wonder why is Europe still struggling so much to realize the strong European digital space, to become a real competitor, or even an alternative to the um, Asian or... Well, of course, that is part of core of my own consideration. So thank you very much uh, for this question. Uh, one of the things uh, where we failed, uh, you know, maybe 10 years ago, was that we never provided a digital single market. Uh, we never enabled a capital market to be there when you wanted to scale. So, so this is what we have been, been doing in the meantime, a real digital single market, a capital market that really works uh, for, for these kind of companies. Right now, I think the most strategically, strategic uh, barrier is, is skills and expertise. Uh, you know, there's a huge lack uh, of people with the necessary insights. And for many people, just to get, you know, basic digital skills, there is still some way to go. So this is a main uh, priority. Uh, you'd see in, in the recovery and resilience plans, for every member state, this is part of what they want to do. So 25, 26 uh, billions uh, available specifically for this. But we need to encourage many more uh, to engage in, in having uh, digital expertise in order to, to keep moving because we have a war, we have a climate crisis, we have inflation, we have an energy crisis, but they're still coding in China, they're still coding in the US. Uh, and of course, the important thing for us is that we keep coding as well and that we keep recruiting people uh, to be part of this uh, amazing uh, societal uh, change that digitization is. Those challenges don't disappear just because we're facing crises that are a little bit more urgent at the moment, right? Exactly. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's really important that we, that we push on uh, to some degree actually accelerate, uh, accelerate the green transition in order to be independent from fossil fuels, in particular from, from uh, Russia, that we accelerate on digital to get the independence uh, that comes from being able to do things uh, on our own and to work closer with, with friends or friendlier territories uh, to get sort of that stronger geopolitical position. I think my colleague Elena also from Sky has a question related to this digital gap that we're talking about. Elena, go ahead. Good, go ahead. <laughs> good morning from Greece. The sun is shining and the wind is blowing here. Um, Mrs. Vestager, um, some serious efforts have been made uh, by Greece this, the, the recent years, but I was wondering, in your opinion, what are the next steps that Greece should follow? 
Well, well, you're right. Um, Greece has taken a, a number, I think, of very important steps. Uh, I very often use uh, Greek examples to say, well, look mm -hmm. what you can do and do fast. Uh, for instance, during the pandemic, uh, making people used uh, to, to use uh, just, you know, simple text messaging to say, I'm going out for this purpose. Uh, now I have the authorization. No paper, quick, fast. Uh, second, uh, the rollout of vaccines, also fully digital, but mm -hmm. enabling people by, by, you know, saying, well, your pharmacist will help you. If you find that this is difficult, you don't feel safe by doing something digital, mm -hmm. there will be people to help you. And I think that's exactly the way to go, to go fully digital, but make sure that if, if citizens feel, I don't really know, can I cope with this, that there is people to help you all the way. So, so mm -hmm. that, I think, is the way to go. Uh, there are important projects of, uh, of digital infrastructure uh, in Greece mm -hmm. and, uh, and sort of the rollout of more and more uh, public services uh, in digital. Uh, I think these are the things to come. But, mm -hmm. but I'd say I'm, I'm really impressed uh, with the Greek uh, progress uh, that has happened uh, over the last uh, two, four years. I'm very much interested in what you mentioned about the question of accompanying that digitalization mm -hmm. and accompanying citizens because the perception that we have sometimes is that because of that digital divide is really difficult to reach out rural communities but mm -hmm. also the early communities. So how can we address those issues? Well, the thing is that if you are 70 today, you may live another 20 years. And if you look back at what did digitalization has happened over the last 20 years, you realize that you cannot just say, no, I've retired, I have the right to just enjoy, I should do nothing else, I should, you know, tend my garden and my grandchildren, this is what I would do. No, you still need to be part of this in order not to feel that you're left out of society. Uh, I also quite often actually meet younger people who are, you know, really able users, but still a bit sort of reluctant when it comes to government services mm -hmm. that are delivered uh, in a digital way. But you cannot have both sort of the old system and a digital system because it's too expensive and you don't get the convenience of a digital system. And this is why I think it's really important, you know, to set up, you know, points of contact where there are real people who understand your situation and can help you and guide you. So you learn a bit every time, but you also uh, are enabled to, to take care of your business, mm. uh, to register as, as a voter. Uh, to, to get your e-description, uh, to, to tend for, for your data if you want a second opinion uh, than one doctor that you can actually allow access to this, that you have people helping you because I think that's also the best way to learn. Instead of taking classes, then learning a bit every time you actually need to do something. Someone that can assist you. We're going to stay in the Mediterranean, but we're going to go to Italy now where Gigi is joining us uh, from Radio 24. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Sestager. Good morning to everybody. Well, I think this is a very essential and central uh, side of this story, being close to the needs. And so my question would be, let's say, two sides. Uh, you gave us an example, which I think is ex excellent, concerning Ukraine and how digitalization help to be on, uh, on track, on field, uh, uh, even though the situation is so dramatic. So. Could you please give us an example on how digital service acts and digital market acts and what may bring to ordinary Europeans? The second side of my question is how this filled with the relation with the US? Because it looks like the Silicon Valley, they really don't like it so much. Thank you so much. Well, for, for a very long time, you know, it was all digital and not a lot of democracy. So at long last, you know, our, our legislator, our governments, uh, members of the European Parliament, they sat down and they decided, well, these are the rules of the game. And, and two things uh, I find to be really important. The first thing is for smaller businesses to get a fair chance of making it when going digital. That it depends on their ideas, their work ethics, their, their funding, that they can make it uh, to us as customers. So we get more choice. Second, that uh, products bought online, that they are safe. That we have the same sense that going to an online shop is as safe as going to a shop in Main Street. 
if you don't like the product, you can actually come back. You can complain about it. You can have, you can use your guarantee, so that we get rid of uh, everything that is uh, false, that where VAT is not paid. You know, all of that you can find online. And last but not least, that the services we use, that they are safe. That platforms will have to assess: is this service safe for people, or do it, you know, mess up their brain? Uh, would it make them addicted uh, to using uh, this uh, this media? or uh, how to get rid of what is clearly illegal. Mm -hmm. So that we you know, focus on freedom of expression while getting rid of what we have agreed is actually not allowed. Could be excitement to terrorism, bomb recipes, uh, child abuse, uh, hate speech, uh, so that we get a, a safer uh, online uh, society. What about the cooperation with the US uh, that Gigi was mentioning? How yeah. are you dealing with that and the companies? No, I think that's a really good point uh, because when I when I started in the job as commissioner for competition uh, seven-ish uh, years ago and opened the first Google case, when I traveled to the U.S., I had this feeling. They say, "What's that woman doing? Crazy stuff." Um, now that has changed so much. You know, there is an alignment of of thought uh, that something needs to be done. There are quite a number of proposals tabled uh, in the U.S. Congress. So when, when we talk about uh, digital matters, for instance, in the Trade and Technology Council, I see much more alignment than you would uh, have expected just two years ago. So, so I think we are, we are on the same page uh, and, of course, also helped by the fact that the Japanese, the South Koreans, the Canadians, the Australians, they very much see things the same way as we would do in Europe. Absolutely. I think Gigi has a follow-up question. Are you still there, Gigi? Yes, I'm here. Go ahead. Actually, uh, yes. Uh, um, I understand that when you say we are on the same page, uh, but then there are different of strength, and still we all Google, we all look our, let's say, uh, news and digital information on almost exclusively exclusively on american based uh, um, platform is this something that will ever change it's it's difficult to say i personally uh, think that having seen how innovative the digital scene is that there will be new services and we thought oh wow this is better than what we had so we change Thank well you. no my point was to say that we are starting a new chapter of digitization where everything digitalizes. So transport, energy, agriculture, um, everything we know of. And that means that sort of the business to business digitization becomes part of the driver. So the first chapter, you know, business to consumers, uh, e-commerce, social media, newsfeed, what have you. The next phase is much more business to business. And here, because of our preparation, because, but also because of European strongholds, you know, a very uh, vibrant uh, industrial community, we have actually a real chance uh, of making it here, and that is the main focus. I, I think it's, it's a priority to make the business-to-business -business digitization work, rather than to see if, if we should have uh, a competitor to Facebook. I think that competitor to Facebook will come, but I think the important thing for Europe is for the business-to-business -business, uh, digitization really to get, you know, scale. Thank you for that. We're going to change topics mm -hmm. now. Um, you know, the war in Ukraine is definitely a humanitarian catastrophe, but also has enormous geopolitical and economic consequences for the European Union. And so where colleagues from Radio Romania were wondering whether the Commission is ready to use some flexibility within the state aid rules to support those businesses that are the most affected both by the war in Ukraine, but also by the sanctions. Yes, uh, that was uh, obvious for us from the very first day, uh, because uh, part of, uh, of the Russian preparation for the invasion uh, was uh, sort of more or less imposing uh, the energy crisis. There were a few other sources to that, but, but the gas prices uh, spike was a main driver of the energy crisis. So we had the energy crisis, then comes uh, the invasion, with that obviously the sanctions. So we put in place uh, very early days what we call a temporary crisis framework 
that enables member states uh, to directly go help businesses who are either uh, suffering because of sanctions or they have problems because of the energy price crisis. So that is in place uh, and we have already seen you know, the first uh, schemes being set up uh, by member states. And we see that this is different from what we did during the pandemic. During the pandemic, you know, government asked businesses to close, customers to stay at home. That sort of took one set of measures to compensate. Now, you know, it's a different set of businesses who have, you know, the, the, the sore end uh, of the sanctions. So that is in place uh, because these are uh, extraordinarily difficult times. The question of sanctions, uh, we have seen five packages so far. There's a negotiation over a six packets of, of sanctions. And one of the issues why we are struggling to agree on that package is the question of the oil embargo. It's clearly opposed by Hungary, but some other member states who rely a lot on, on oil from Russia, they're also putting some issues to that package on sanctions. And I think that my colleague Marta from mm -hmm. the Bulgarian National Radio has a question about that. Yes, thank you. Hello, Horun Sofia. Um, Madam uh, Vestager, I would like to ask you how possible it is for some countries like mine and like uh, some others who are, that are highly dependent on the Russian oil, how possible it is to have some kind of derogation of the possible oil embargo on Russian? Thank you. Well, I think here is that solidarity is, is the key. Because I think it's only natural that it takes more time to negotiate this sixth package because it will be really severe on Russia. But some member states uh, who are quite dependent on Russian oil, of course, for them, it's a, it's a big transition to do within a very short time frame. And, and this is why it, of course, takes a bit of time to figure out how to deal with this. Because uh, citizens need to know that this is manageable that the government is there, that they can still support the sanctions. And, and for me, the important thing is not to have a derogation uh, from the sanction. It is to see that other member states step up to help out. I think that is the only way really to deal with this, um, because then we get you know, two effects at the same time. Uh, we get sort of the independence from Russian oil, and we can also plan for the future how to, uh, how to transition uh, into renewables uh, and how to do that in, in a more sort of pan-European way so that no member state feel that they are left uh, just to, to solve their problems on their own because since uh, these sanctions because becomes more and more intrusive, really there is a need for member states uh, to come together. Something that we have seen, right, that if we want to hit Russia, we know that we're going to have to face the consequences of those sanctions as well. Um, you were talking before about the question of energy and how the European Commission was already preparing to ease the impact of the energy crisis on different countries. Um, we had this week uh, the Commission coming up with the Repower EU strategy, mm -hmm. which is meant indeed to disconnect from Russia, but also to help the different countries in different situations with different energy mix to go through that transition and to support their own mm -hmm. businesses and their households. Um, one of the uh, things that we have seen happening lately um, is the strategy to try to help households. And in this case, um, there was this proposal by Spain and Portugal about a particular system for the Iberian Peninsula. Mm -hmm. And I think Lucia, who is coming from Spain, has a question about that. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my my question is: If uh, is the agreement with Spain and Portugal a real exception, or is it a formula that could be explored in other places? And if uh, you are worried that this could affect the proper functioning of other markets, such as the French one, thank you. First and foremost, I really appreciate your comment uh, leading up to this uh, question, because the point is that even though we have an energy market that integrates more and more, there are still huge differences among member states. Uh, Spain, Portugal being really advanced uh, on renewables, uh, others much more dependent on, um, on nuclear, others again still having you know, uh, quite a lot of their energy coming from coal and, and other fossil fuels. So, of course, what we do should have the necessary flexibility for member states to see, well, 
actually there are solutions that would work for me. Uh, the, the Spanish Portuguese uh, solution, which is a cap on the uh, gas price that is then compensated by everyone paying a bit more uh, so that the, the, the differences between the cap and the stock price uh, actually can, can make the gas producer stay in the market for, for the marginal production. I, I think it will work in, in, in Spain. Um, a bit of that sort of um, cheaper energy will flow into France because there is an interconnector. But it's a small interconnector. Uh, I think about 10% uh, will go into France. Um, and I think that is the limitation. It's not the model in itself, but the fact that energy can flow uh, to other countries. Uh, because if you're fully integrated, then, of course, it's much more difficult uh, to do a national measure where only some consumers then would pay for the fact that you need to compensate the, the gas um, uh, purchase. Uh, that doesn't work so well if you have some consumers to pay, but you have a fully integrated market so that many more consumers get a benefit of, uh, of the lower prices. But remains to be seen uh, because we are, of course, open if member states want to test this. About that. We have seen the Avarian case, this uh, cap price on, on gas. Is there any formal that the Commission could explore that could help reduce the, uh, the increase in prices for uh, consumers' bills, while at the same time preserving the fair competition within the single market? Well, here, member states, they are in the driving seat, uh, because as I said, uh, these, there are huge differences, also as to whether consumers have long-term contracts or they are directly affected by the, by the stock, um, energy stock price. So what we would advise member states to do is to directly support, in particular, of course, households where you have maybe a very small budget and where increased energy crisis, prices, they basically eat up a huge uh, portion uh, of what you make in, in a week or a month. So, so go directly uh, to the consumer uh, and support them. And this is not even state aid. You can just, you can just go ahead uh, and support consumers. Of course, uh, it is costly, but hopefully it's something that will not be, be lasting for a, a too long time, even though we do think that the higher prices, they will remain with us uh, for uh, yeah, still quite some time to go. We're going to go now to Poland, where Michal is joining us. And I think we're going to stay in the topic of the war in Ukraine, but with a different turn. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning from uh, Warsaw. Uh, war in Ukraine affects uh, many areas of uh, economy, energy, food security, but also the new technologies, uh, I mean, the semiconductor. Uh, issue because we feel the lack of semiconductors in uh, European market and global markets for uh, so many, many months. And now situation can be even worse because Ukraine is one of the biggest uh, neon gas producers in the world. So uh, there's, there's a, a threat that there's going to be more problems with semiconductors on the uh, market. European Union has a strategy uh, on semiconductors, but uh, how does the war in Ukraine affect that strategy? Do you uh, plan any changes, any reforms? Uh, that's that's a very interesting thing, and we uh, don't say much about it, but that's another factor uh, which could pose a threat to our uh, new technologies, markets, and businesses. That's I, I think that's an excellent point, uh, because we need to push on with our strategy for semiconductors. You know, we have this open window for establishment of first-of-a-kind production in Europe, so large-scale semiconductor production. Uh, because today, you know, Europe in Europe, only 10% of global uh, value is being produced, quite specialized, uh, very high level. But there's no production sort of of, uh, of uh, sort of future-proof uh, uh, chips. Just to establish that is really important. But the, the question is extremely relevant because it focuses on the raw material that goes into the production. And, and here it's important for us uh, to work uh, with the US and to create sort of a, a coalition of countries who can provide. Because we see that Canada, that Australia, uh, Norway for, for other uh, materials, well, 
they say, oh, we're more than happy uh, to chip in here, but we need a long-term perspective. Mm. If you can make a framework so that businesses can engage for the long term, then we will invest so much more. So, so that work is ongoing right now. We discussed it at the, the G7 meeting uh, just last week, uh, two weeks ago. So, so we're pushing for this. Uh, but it may take some time, and, and I, I completely take the point that the lack of something essential like neon gas uh, can slow uh, the already um, semiconductor shortage, uh, can, can slow the supply down even more. And, and it is a problem because, uh, you know, in an advanced economy as the European one, semiconductors, they are essential for so many products. Mm. This strategy that the European Commission put forward was pre-crisis, pre-war. Mm. How has affected the strategy of the Commission, these shortages of gas? Well, I think uh, it has made us uh, even more insisting uh, that we need to pull this strategy off. Uh, the paradox is that, that already in 2014, uh, the then Commission set out to say, well, Europe needs to produce at least 20% of value. Nothing happened uh, back in those days. So why do we think that things can happen now? Well, first and foremost, uh, because we see the urgency to a completely different uh, level because of the geopolitics. Mm -hmm. And the war only makes that much more obvious. And the second reason why we think it will happen this time is that we have specific projects on ground. Uh, you know, Intel have a project with European businesses, Global Foundries have a project with European businesses, TSMC project with European businesses. So real action taken on ground. I think everyone focusing their minds saying this will have to happen. Uh, and this is also why it's a matter of urgency to establish ourselves with new long-term uh, supply of uh, the necessary raw materials. Absolutely. Let's now move to the fence, and I want to welcome uh, my colleague Richard from Latvian Radio. Yes, hello to everyone from uh, Riga. Thank you. And uh, on Wednesday, you have presented this uh, plan on strengthening of, of uh, the European defense industry, where you talk about uh, the need for the European uh, Union countries to invest together in order to create uh, synergies and it uh, definitely sounds good in theory but my question is uh, uh, what makes you think that uh, there will be a desire to buy european arms uh, from each other after uh, for instance uh, this uh, german reluctance to allow sending weapons uh, produced in their country to ukraine thank you It has, uh, it has been a bit of a headache for us why this has not happened before. Uh, because we have a benchmark, we would like 35% of uh, military spending to, to be spent together with member states uh, coming together. Today it's 10% or something like that. I think that things have changed. Um, the war has changed Europe. Uh, I think every week we, we develop our thinking. Uh, the fact that so many member states now have pledged that they will actually increase uh, their defense uh, budgets, uh, the fact that so many they, they sent their equipment uh, to Ukraine, uh, of course together with, uh, with US uh, uh, friends uh, in order to enable the Ukrainians uh, to defend themselves, that creates uh, really increased uh, demand because not only have the threats increased, you know, the cyber threats are really uh, increasing, but also sort of the, uh, the threat of someone actually invading your territory. You know, six months ago, we would have said, well, come on, who's going to invade? Mm. And now we are in a completely different situation. And then uh, there is the need to, to, to refill stocks because, you know, ammunition is being used, uh, vehicles are being used, um, things need to be restocked. So there is a change of situation, and I think there is a change of mind. Uh, and these are taxpayer money that we're talking about. So every taxpayer should have the expectation that, in particular, increased funding is used as efficient as possible. Uh, and that will also allow more interoperability between different pieces of military equipment so that it's easier also to use it together, watch each uh, national uh, uh, 
army or, or defense uh, capability is actually investing in. But it will take a lot of effort because the go-to position for member states is I buy my own stuff. Hmm. Another thing that uh, the crisis in Ukraine is accelerating is the defense union indeed. We go now uh, to Daniel from 100.7 radio in Luxembourg. So inevitably we're talking about tax. <laughs> yes, thank you very much for the floor. Good morning to everybody. Yeah, um, I'm uh, going to take you uh, back to Google, actually. Um, you, you said that uh, some people in the US were saying, what is she doing? I guess the same goes for some uh, governments also in, in, in the EU who weren't always happy about um, what the commission uh, was doing on uh, to make sure that big companies must pay their fair uh, share of taxes. Um, in the past, the Commission lost some cases um, before the European Court, um, where member states or companies questioned uh, the fact that they got special treatment and took advantage of illegal uh, state aids. So with all these experiences uh, of the last years in mind, and also taking into account that these cases take a long time these procedures uh, are very long. And um, so my question is, um, would you still think that EU's comp competition rules or state aid rules are the right instrument uh, to fight tax evasion? Well, they, they are one of the instruments. Um, and the court has, has confirmed both in cases that we have won and cases that we have lost that we can use this tool. But but they will not do the main trick. Uh, the main trick is for, for a member state to change their legislation, which has actually happened. Luxembourg has changed the uh, part of their legislation and also how they actually grant, um, uh, for instance, a, uh, a, a tax exemption to make sure that it's in accordance with their legislation. And uh, uh, Cyprus have uh, changed legislation. I think Malta have changed legislation. So national changes is another tool. Uh, but the third uh, tool is, of course, global cooperation. Uh, and here we now have the, the OECD extended format, so I think 180 countries or something like that, agreeing on big companies sort of distributing part of their uh, taxable income to where they actually do their business. And also to agree on a minimum level of effective taxation of 15%. So now the next part of, of our, our fight uh, for tax justice is that this agreement actually becomes implemented. Uh, because the combination of us doing our part with our state aid tools, member states themselves changing legislation, and of course that we can make it work on ground with the global agreement that we have, that is, is the, the real key uh, for, for tax justice to be a thing. And we're still struggling for member states to actually agree to that agreement at EU level for the implementation. We, we're not there yet, but it's not only us. Of course, we also need the, the rest of the world uh, <laughs> to come on board. Uh, but, but we will do our homework uh, to say, well, that we will do this as well. I think uh, Daniela has a follow-up question. Yeah, actually, two short <laughs> follow-ups, if I may. Um, you said that we are we are not there yet, and actually, um, at EU level, for in, for the moment, uh, Poland is uh, kind of objecting, uh, or seems to object, um, the, this minimal tax agreement. So I, I'd like to you to have your comment on that um, specific case, and more generally, I mean aiming at international agreements uh, rather than using the instrument of, of state aid rules is also what the Luxembourgish uh, government has preached during the, the last years. And uh, it always highlighted uh, the famous level playing fields. Um, you seem to agree. So um, my question is, um, this will take time. As you said, we're not there yet. Meanwhile, companies keep on uh, taking advantage of the low taxes like uh, also in countries like uh, Luxembourg. So are you not making false promises here to the people in Europe? Well, I, I'm, I'm really trying not to promise anyone anything, uh, because in particular when it comes to taxation, really difficult to make sure that you can actually get there. But my point in the first 
uh, answer was to say, we need a toolbox. We, we do not just have one solution. There's no such thing as a silver bullet when it comes to taxation. So we need the state aid instruments. We must continue doing cases. Uh, we need member states to look at how do we do ourselves. And this is why, you know, obliging member states to exchange information about tax is part of this tool, uh, toolbox. And last but not least, the international agreement. And, and I don't think that any of these things can stand alone uh, because it is so ingrained in, in some countries uh, that for this also cultural change and change in country business models, uh, of course, we need to keep pushing. I have learned that one needs to be patient uh, when it comes to, to real changes on ground uh, in taxation. Uh, and I can only maintain my patience because I actually do see that progress uh, is being made. But I can promise no one tax justice, but I can just promise that I will do my best to achieve it. We're getting to the end of uh, this uh, year and a plus summit, so I'm going to have two questions. I'm going to mm -hmm. ask you to be a little bit more brief on these ones. The first one is coming from, Lithu from Lithuania because of the tension that we have seen between Vilnius and um, um, China over Taiwan and how that can have an impact on EU policy. Are we able to have a cooperation with China when we see that aggressive behavior towards one of our member states? Well, that, of course, makes it uh, increasingly difficult. Uh, and this is why we have put in, in place sort of these measures to work against uh, sort of uh, cohesive uh, actions. Um, because sometimes, you know, it is, it is done in ways where our sort of normal international sets of rules is, is not really working in order to say, well, obviously something is wrong here. But there are made turns and, 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 and twists that, uh, that makes the normal rules not working. So we have this new tool uh, against uh, coercive uh, measures. And, and we have a complex relationship uh, with China because they're a systemic rival. We consider ourselves full democracies. They're an economic competitor. Uh, we need to do much more in Europe. Uh, we need a different level of sort of, you know, uh, self-determination. Uh, um, but China is also a partner when it comes to fighting climate change. Uh, no matter how good we are, no matter how much we push in Europe, we need China on board, we need India on board, uh, we need the US on board, you know, we need the world to come on board. Um, and I think it's important that we can have a complex uh, relationship because in, in the geopolitics of this world, if we would only work with people who are the same uh, as we are, I don't think that we could change uh, as fast uh, as we need to, to change. But I think it's really important that we get the tool to say, this is wrong, this needs to change. One last question. We have been talking today about many different issues mm -hmm. and what they all have in common is that a major change in the geopolitics of the world are affecting the way we do things. What are the main challenges that you think the EU has ahead and what are the main changes that you see happening in the coming years? Well, what have, what have enabled us uh, to act fast is that politicians, uh, citizens, voters see this as an, as an obvious thing where we must act together. So it's really important uh, to keep citizens uh, on board because for some citizens there is hardship, uh, obviously uh, directly for, for Ukrainians, uh, for Ukrainians who, who are being killed, who lost their loved one, who lose their, their, all their assets and their actives, their society is, is under attack. But, but also in, in Europe you find people uh, who have a really hard time because of increasing prices, increasing energy prices. So, so to, to keep people on board to say we are in this together. And that has been successful so far and we should build on this because for once the crisis is not an institutional crisis. The institutions work, we deliver. Commission, Council, Parliament, there's delivery. Uh, and that enables us to deal with the war, energy crisis, inflation, climate crisis. Um, and I think that is the important point, to maintain that. Of course, listen to one another, find compromise, but to maintain that the strength comes from us working together. That, that is always the main challenge in Europe. And then, of course, to reach out to friends. Now we have the Trade and Technology Council. 
next phase to invite more sort of uh, TTC spin-offs uh, to, to make coalitions on, uh, on raw materials uh, in order for, for us to say, well, we want to work with everyone that wants to work with us, but we want to do that on a European footing. Thank you so much, Executive Vice President, and thank you to our network for their contributions today. And thank you for joining us today. Take a look at the website of Euronet Plus and check out our articles and podcasts on a wide range of EU mm -hmm. topics as reported from Brussels and across the EU.